Socket AM1 is an odd one. Back when it came out, the internet was clamouring to call it the best budget option available with 4 cores on the cheap, based on a similar architecture to the current consoles. But now, in 2019, just how is the state of the platform? This right here is an AMD Athlon 5350, one of the top spec AM1 chips from back in the day based on the Jaguar architecture coming in with 4 cores that clock in at 2GHz, it actually sounds rather impressive on paper. But do keep in mind this is coming in back in 2014, so 5 years ago now. But back in the day it cost around $50 or around £35 as I remember these things being dirt cheap. It comes with an integrated GPU section which is based on the Sea Islands architecture, essentially a Radeon R3 or HD8400 series depending on what drivers you're using and what it actually flags up as. It has 128 shading units and uses the RAM as VRAM which maxes out at standard spec DDR3 1600MHz stuff. But the most impressive aspect other than the price was the TDP which was a measly 25 watts, so we've established the CPU itself isn't actually that bad on paper. But my main concern is that it has no L3 cache, but you know the AM3 Athlon's never had any L3 cache so overall it doesn't seem too shabby personally but I've never used one of these, so you never know how well it will hold up. Before that we actually need to get a bit of a test system together so I threw together some basic specifications including 16GB of DDR3 RAM and a standard 120GB SSD, which is all this really needs to get you going for now, as we will be using things like this to generally just see how it performs, but for anyone that's noticed we do actually have access to a PCIe slot, which means that we can use a GPU so you guessed it I did end up sticking an overkill AMD Fury so that we can see the full CPU side performance later on, of course we mostly just want to see the APU performance but it works out quite nice to be able to see just what the CPU itself can handle when paired with a giant 300 watt graphics card. Anyway, I'd like to say a special thank you to Mike, aka the Geekster, who has been asked to have you know the system named Friar Tuck in his memory because you know he donated this stuff. So because he made the joys of AM1 possible on the channel, it shall be done. This is now the test system called Fryer Tuck. Anyway, I'll be testing across three different settings or specifications or setups, however you want to put it. One with a dedicated graphics card, one with the APU running at 1366 MHz RAM, and the other one with it running with 1600 MHz RAM, just so we can see how well everyone's performance is with either the low spec memory or the high spec memory or those that have paired it with a graphics card. Because we want to find out just how everyone who bought one of these is holding on to them, because it's a strange thing with this series of APU. They are Appeared, people bought them once they saw four cores available on the cheap and then they just went from there and I haven't seen these things in years. But this is budget build so we're going to find out if they've aged like fine wine on the cheap and you know the alternative if they've aged in a similar vein to the FX series where they're better left forgotten in the past burning in the back of a dumpster. Anyway let's see how the AM1 platform holds up five years later once we get it set up. So up first we have the likes of CSGO, of which I tested not only the casual game mode as usual, but also the Battle Royale, and given the fact I've been using this system for just over a week now as my main system to get a feel for it, I can definitely confirm that competitive is a no-go. The reason for this? It's so slow at this game that VAC actually kicked me from the game. It told me VAC wasn't working on this system and kicked me. I have no idea why there was nothing else running, I'm going to put it down to this system just being incredibly slow. Overall, with the lowest resolution in 640x480, it was a hopeless experience, and it was just about passable for casual game modes as you can see, but overall even with those settings it was a tad hopeless. Yes, using an AMD Fury with it did help but even then we were very CPU limited, with the experience being very similar to that of a Core 2 Duo, although slightly more stable given the additional cores. The same goes for the Battle Royale mode, which was exactly the same as the other game modes, but slightly less stable overall. So not really off to a good start considering this game came out before the CPU was released. But the year is 2019, isn't it? So I fired up Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which one of the more intensive games out there, just to see how well this little CPU can hold up in modern titles that came out five years after its initial release, and just how well did it fare. 
Well, with low settings, I was surprised at how well it ran, and by that I mean I was surprised that it wasn't as much as a slideshow as I thought it was going to be, but overall not really playable, even with a dedicated graphics card like the AMD Fury, also while using the DirectX 12 API. We saw sub 30 FPS the vast majority of the time, and it's worth noting that the game took nearly 7 minutes to load up, 10 minutes if you include all the title screens. For some reason, the CPU just does not like loading these large games. Really not the best experience, especially for a CPU that is only five years older than this actual title. Next on our list was meant to be Apex Legends, which for some reason wouldn't start on the CPU. I'm fairly sure it's meant to work, because we've got the applicable instruction sets that it requires, but in the end, given the fact it wouldn't start, I decided to benchmark PUBG as our routine battle royale game, which worked okay, not brilliantly, and by that I mean it started, which is something, I mean the Pentium 4 wasn't able to start the game. It handled itself better than a Call 2 Duo did, but ultimately, even on the lowest settings, it's not a good experience and is best avoided, because, you know, you just can't get a good experience on it. You know, you can't see people, the input lag is so bad you can move your mouse and expect to wait five minutes to actually see it happen. And even with a better graphics card like an AMD Fury, you know, it was shown to not actually be much better given how CPU limited we were. A similar case in terms of performance was Fallout 4, which shows that the latest iteration of Bethesda's beautiful engine just isn't capable of running on such low specifications by itself. Although, with the AMD Fury credit where credit's due, you know, it did get 35 FPS on average, although heavy dips when going around cities, which was quite common. But you know, when you're out exploring the wastes, it was actually decent hovering around the 40 FPS region. Ultimately, not exactly a go-to experience if you're on the iGPU, but with a moderately capable graphics card, yes, it can run this game. Hitman with DirectX 12 was a similar story, because it was hardly playable with the iGPU, but substantially better with a graphics card. N not playable this time though, just substantially better, as we were so CPU limited that there isn't exactly much of a way to get this running properly on this CPU. But I was still coloured surprised by the average, maybe it's the DirectX 12 API, maybe it's just because the internal graphics chip is just so bad it can't run the game at anything more than a slideshow frame rate. but once again another modern title is a no-go for the APU. Although. Maybe you might be able to tweak it to work. I don't think you can though, so ultimately Hitman is a no-go on the Athlon 5350 and AM1 in general. And finally, to round off our modern games, we have GTA 5, which is something that this little APU was praised for being able to run. And I must say that after the game loaded in, which took near on 10 minutes, honestly, trying to load anything on this CPU will take an eternity, even using an SSD. But once we were there, it was very nearly playable with the integrated graphics. I mean, you're seeing the 1366 megahertz gameplay on screen right now. It's actually quite surprising for a 25 watt APU by itself, but with a dedicated graphics card, it really held its own. In fact, this is one game that I remember this APU being actually recommended for on a lot of forums. See, a lot of people back in 2015 wanted to try and play GTA 5. And the best way to get into playing GTA 5 on the cheap was the fact that this £35 APU could run the game on its integrated graphics in a HD resolution. I mean, no, it's not going to look pretty, but you can actually play the PC version pretty well on the APU side of things. So, you know, I'm not surprised, but I am impressed because it's holding its own in this game. After that though, you know, we have emulation. Stuff like N64 and PlayStation is passable and will work mostly, other than a few intensive N64 games, because the state of emulation there is a bit funny depending on the title you're trying to run. Ultimately though, when it comes to native resolution GameCube games, even the simpler ones like Wind Waker here will drop frames. This is of course on the iGPU, so I could definitely see for an older emulation style setup, this little 25 watt thing in a small cabinet or something like that could be very useful for those older consoles, but really for something like a GameCube or a Wii, you're going to need something a bit more powerful.
But you guys know how we are over on this channel and how we like to go about things, so I tested a few more things on this little CPU. I mean, overall, I haven't really enjoyed much of my time with the APU, as even with an SSD, you know, the desktop just feels so sluggish and slow. And we're using relatively optimal parts to test it with, even with the AMD Fury, it felt the exact same. I just can't find much to like about this system other than the media decoding, which was actually really nice. You know, media decoding was surprisingly smooth, and multitasking was okay. Okay isn't as better than a Core 2 Duo, but anything more intensive than a few tabs will really lock up performance. You know, I went to the effort of taking off the cooler while running a stress test just to see how cool it runs, and I can confirm that the CPU, you know, it, it doesn't really use any power at all, and it doesn't really get warm at all either. So there's a definitely a redeeming factor in the fact that it ran for about 5 minutes with no cooler and didn't really get above 60 degrees. Overall though, desktop usage was poor in my opinion, gaming performance was about the same, and other than that, you know, things like server hosting, operating as a file server, media decoding, things like that it does handle beautifully, so credit where credit's due, it is very good at things like that. But, you know... We've still got more tests to run, despite the fact that people actually recommended this thing for gaming back in the day, I was disappointed. So I thought, you know, if people are recommending it for gaming, why don't we try the thing that's next to gaming with some live streaming. So using 1000 kilobits per second and entirely coding on the CPU, we had an okay stream in the beginning. But within half an hour, the CPU was struggling to keep up with itself, creating a slideshow that you can see here. Not to mention the issue I had with games crashing for some reason. I mean... Half-Life 1 shouldn't be crashing when I try to change resolution, but it does on this system. Overall, you can see the uh, example of a stream here, and I'll just put like a 20 second clip. Straight past me. There's no hitboxes. There's no real storyline. I have no idea what I'm doing. If anything, but the open-endedness and complete lack of sense this makes, makes it better than Half-Life 1 in every way. And is the reason why we chose to play this beautifully developed mod rather than the real game. Because I'm only two minutes in, and I'm lost. Horribly lost. We now have a shotgun for no particular reason. We have no health either, and we will die instantly as soon as we touch anything. Is this stream as bad as it sounds, or is it just me? I mean, any opinions? Because I personally think this stream's awful. Personally, I found the CPU to be a bit of a pain in the ass, and I just don't know why, as it's not like it's all that weak. I even found it to perform better than a Phenom X3 in benchmarks, but then again, that CPU is well on a decade old and has one core less than this. Ultimately, that's about how it performs though in the CPU and GPU aspects. About 10 year old performance at only 25 watts of power, and a very, very low price. That holds true for games and desktop usage as well, it performs like a 10 year old part on the desktop, with the one area where it really exceeded my expectations being media usage and server hosting. For those areas, you know, this thing's absolutely fine. You might as well go and grab one if you see one cheap enough because the running costs are peanuts. Overall, though, there isn't much else to say other than AM1. Other than, you know, you have not aged as well as people were saying you were going to. And those that did buy you, well, let's just say it's not your GPU that's at fault. So in conclusion once again, the AM1 socket is personally one of the worst aging sockets that I've used in a while, so thank you very much to the Geekster for sending me this beautiful system to test. I'll be honest, the form factor and overall okay performance is alright, and yes, in a lot of older titles it is actually a very capable system, so I'll give it some credit there. I'm just underwhelmed by how poor the CPU performed for a very recent CPU. I mostly deal with CPUs way older than this, and frankly, they just felt snappier. If that makes any sense at all to you guys. Once you're actually doing a task, like gaming, it felt fine, as long as the game was old enough, but on the lead up to getting it there, it just wasn't nice. It felt like it should be quicker than it really was. Any more than a few tabs in a web browser would bring the system down to a crawl, so really, at the end of the day, there isn't much else to say. For your older titles and for media tasks, go for it. You can pick these things up dirt cheap. If you actually intend to use this little device, well, you know, I'd probably opt for an 1155 system. They'll use more power, but it'll destroy this thing in terms of performance at the same price point. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed this little look back, and I'll catch you in the next one. Good night. 
While I certainly hope this look back was interesting, I've been trying to cover a lot more of these platforms that people are still using and buying, but they don't actually get any coverage. So, hopefully that covers all the things, you can like and subscribe for more content like this, and I'll catch you in the next one. Thank you.